Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you, Hernan and Divyanish, uh, especially for uh, setting up all the all the arrangements. I really appreciate it. Um, it's been uh, been great talking to the different different folks over the last couple hours. It's been really uh, really excellent. So today um, the discussion is going to be focused on seismic, but really to encompass multi-hazard design. And before we do that, I want to talk just briefly about ERI. And I know we, you know, we have right now we have a little small group, and so most of you are probably familiar with ERI. But um, I'm a huge fan. Uh, I've been a member, gosh, for um, I would say maybe 25 years. So pretty much right after uh, I started working, it's just always been a great organization in terms of what I what I want to do and what I've done and different types of work. Um, so a few things about ERI. One of the things that's key is, you know, we talked about the, uh, the design competition uh, with your team earlier today, and that was great. They also have these travel grants, which are great. Um, Spectra is a fantastic journal as far as earthquake engineering goes. And of course, the, the Friedman Family Professionals Program, which is what this is part of. Uh, learning from earthquakes, there's a travel study program. And I don't know if any of the students at, at UMass have taken advantage of that, but uh, a lot of students I know find that very worthwhile. And then they also offer incentives for those folks just kind of getting going in their uh, professional life in terms of uh, having reduced rates for, uh, for membership. And I will say, I know there's a lot of different organizations. There's ASCE and many other organizations. And one thing that's so different and so great about ERI is how they combine um, structural, the geotechnical and the social sciences into one group. I find that just incredible. Um, having been on uh, um, you know, earthquake reconnaissance teams and so forth, and also worked with others being able to discuss and learn things like from social scientists and from others. It's just, it's been an incredible experience. So um, I, I highly recommend uh, the ERI membership. So with that, um, here's the, basically the presentation. Again, the, this is, a, you know, this is seismic, this ERI, but I really wanted to touch on what's going on in, in, in the greater community in terms of multi-hazard design. So, you know, with things have been changing with the weather patterns and some other types of issues. Um, we're being asked to design not just for what we call conventional loads, wind, seismic, but there's also some unconventional loads. And so I think it's important to, to understand what those are and at least how to, to integrate those, at least um, at first blush with some of the other design loads that, uh, that we typically think about. So let's just quickly talk about multi-hazard design. And, uh, this has been kind of a, uh, a topic of interest for me for, for many years since we do a lot of this type of design. And when I first started, I, I often wondered, how do you work multi-hazard design in with the conventional design? So we'll talk a little bit about earthquake, wind, and snow. And we already, you know, we already designed for those tornadoes, hurricanes, floods. We have natural and versus man-made um, types of hazards. And then again, if it's not in the building code, you know, where do we find this information and uh, how do we how do we apply it? So for conventional loads, typically we we have the building codes and right now, uh, thankfully, we have a single code. Uh, when I was first starting out, we used to have three different codes governing the United States, but now we have the International Building Code. Uh, and it basically references for most things structural, the ASCE 7 uh, standard. And right now we're on ASC 7-16, where 7-22 will, uh, will be coming out shortly. And so we can see the loads, the conventional loads that these codes cover. And so that those should be pretty familiar to, to most of us. So, but then we have these unconventional loads that people talk about that a lot of owners are starting to worry about and a lot of agencies and you know, federal clients also put a lot of emphasis on. So, when we look at wind, uh, there's a lot of places to go for wind. We can go to the building code and it will show us the standard wind forces. But if we want something to, to speak to the extreme wind loads, 
two, two of the guidelines we typically reach for are the ICC 500 standard, which is the standard for the design and construction of storm shelters. And there is a FEMA document, P361, which is a safe rooms for tornadoes and hurricanes document. And both documents are excellent in terms of helping engineers understand A, what type of design loads should be considered and B, how to really go about that design. So both these documents are, are excellent resources. For those of you that don't, haven't seen or really know much about extreme wind for tornadoes, we actually use the enhanced Fujita scale. So we had the Fujita scale several years ago and then the uh, National Weather Service made some changes. You can see the types of wind speeds. So it, it is not unusual, uh, especially in certain parts of the country to get wind speeds you know, of 180 miles an hour um, from a tornadic event. So that would put us typically at an EF4. What's interesting about this scale is that it's similar to, I always think it's similar to the MMI scale that we use in seismic in that basically use qualitative measurements to, to back fit the, uh, the EF ranking. So, right, so we don't really measure, we measure a wind speed, but often we don't have the ability to measure wind speeds throughout where the, uh, the tornadic event might occur. So what happens is teams go to the event afterwards, they look at the types of damage, similar to what we would do for intensities in, in the MMI scale. They look at the type of damage and then they backfit that to the EF scale. So you can see where we typically experience a lot of extreme wind. So luckily, or, or not luckily, it depends, I guess, on your perspective, but luckily uh, it doesn't really overlap with some of the high seismicity except in the Midwest and perhaps a little bit in, in, the, in the South Carolina region. Um, from a uh, hurricane wind standpoint, a lot of us are familiar with the Saffir Simpson hurricane scale. And again, you know, we have, we measure the wind and typically there we can measure the wind to a, a more exact scale because we know the hurricane's coming. We have that advanced warning. The storm surge that's associated with these different categories is a little bit more of a uh, toss up. I think the ranges can even be bigger than what's shown. But what we do know is that we seem to have more hurricanes on a more frequent basis and they're more devastating when they do make landfall. So. That is something that we are concerned about as a, as a profession. And we know that owners that are interested in having their, their structures remain after an event are, are gaining in popularity. So, you know, it used to be in the past that people would just feel unlucky, for instance, if they were struck by a hurricane. And nowadays, basically, you see a lot of important structures, especially that are asked to be, to, to be designed for those type of loads. And this is typically where we see the, the greatest hurricane risk, of course, is the East Coast and the Gulf region of the United States. So one of the interesting things about hurricanes is that not only do we design for the wind, but we also design for what we call windborne debris. And for those of you that may are maybe not familiar with this, basically what this specifies is an object and for the, the lower parts of the structure, typically it's a two by four um, and it has a wind speed and it's basically specified to strike the structure at a certain miles per hour, either horizontal on a horizontal surface or a vertical surface. So this is a, is a pretty novel idea, especially to, to folks that have never designed for this type of element. But I have a little picture that I always find kind of Interesting, and hopefully this will run here. So this is a, um, a video showing what it looks like when they do these tests. So what I wanted to, sh oh. so this is wood frame construction. And then I want to advance and just show you. So this is brick. So you can see, um, for those of us, you know, that actually that work with masonry, 
what the, what this type of debris or what this type of objects will actually do um, when it strikes a, a masonry structure, which is pretty incredible uh, when you think about it. So that was kind of a quick tour of the wind. I think a lot of engineers these days get challenged to design in wind, either maybe not for tornadic wind, but definitely if you work down in the Gulf area, you get the challenge to design for hurricane type, type wind. Something that a lot of engineers do not understand or are not asked to design for is blast. Um, and unfortunately, I think blast is becoming a bigger part of our design um, portfolio, not only because government agencies are very concerned about it, and we also have industry that is also has their own challenges from a blast standpoint, but just you know, typical buildings, important structures, structures that are considered of, of monumental value uh, are also concerned about different types of, of blast events. So when we talk about blast and we talk about uh, what we call ATFP, which is anti-terrorism force protection design, uh, the very first place we start is typically with a risk assessment to figure out what type of risk our structure faces. And typically that, that starts with the type of perimeter and then what we call standoff. And from a blast perspective, um, as many of you probably know, that distance is our friend, right? So the, the blast pressures is typically a pressure and an impulse that will vary typically with it by a cube of the distance. So the more distance we can get away from the structure or the more we can stand off uh, the threat, the less the pressure, considerably less the pressure will be on our structure. So from a perspective, where, where do we go as engineers or structural engineers? Maybe we have a, a background in seismic, maybe we don't. And we're being asked to look at BLAST. There, there's some excellent, excellent um, literature sources. The first is on the left, is that ACE BLAST standard. And this is basically covers the blast protection of buildings. The document on the right deals with progressive collapse. So progressive collapse is basically the investigation of a structure when a key element, typically a column is removed. And then we look to see what happens with the rest of the structure. Other important guidelines, we see a, a uniform, a unified facilities criteria on the left. This is the DOD's uh, anti-terrorism standard for buildings. And then on the right, we have a blast resistant buildings uh, primer that was put together as part of a petrochemical facilities um, series of, of books. So what I typically recommend for younger engineers or new grads interested in blast is this, build, this publication on the right. I find this to be uh, a very easy read and actually a very excellent first, first book, if you will, to kind of introduce the topic. So for those of you that may work in or get interested in fields or may work for firms that do this type of design, strongly recommend uh, the publication on the right. So many of you know about BLAST, but for those of you that, that don't, you know, we, we think of BLAST in different terms. Again, it's really a dynamic problem, but it's obviously much different than uh, seismic. The main thing, of course, is the, the time. And the time domain is, is in milliseconds typically versus the seconds that we typically think about in seismic. And then we have different sources and different types of explosions. So you can see on the left, you know, we talk about the sources of blasts and the type of explosions. And these are all important to us because they basically dictate what this figure in the upper right will look like. But the key is to understand that this pressure and the time generates this curve. We have a positive phase and we have a negative phase. And this duration is extremely, extremely short. So again, this is in milliseconds. So this is a video of a high speed, high speed film. And what's interesting about this, and I'll go back a little bit, is that you can actually see the shock wave as it, you can see the shock wave as it radiates out from the blast. And so this is something to think about. Again, this is outside, so this is a free field test. And so the shock wave actually has somewhere to go. Now, if this was inside a structure or adjacent to a structure where that shock wave is going to uh, impact the structure, you can think about what, what that would mean. 
So again, this is actually in milliseconds. So this was a very, a very uh, slowed down version of what the actual event would look like. So how do we design for BLAST or ATFP? We have a lot of methods. So we have our single degree of freedom, uh, which those of you that have taken structural dynamics, maybe you, you recall, um, that's our basic, that's our go-to system, if you will, for the BLAST design. We have a multi-degree of freedom system, which gets a little bit more complicated. And then we have some great new tools, uh, such as computational fluid dynamics. So computational fluid dynamics actually lets us use fluid dynamics to basically simulate uh, BLAST, whereas you know, 15, 20, 25 years ago, a lot of the information that we could only gather via testing, now we can use a uh, computational fluid dynamics type of software to go ahead and get that information without the destructive testing. And of course, we also have our more standard FEA analysis. On the bottom left, so this is a, um, a pressure tube. Uh, sometimes they uh, test basically windows or doors. And the way this works is it's not, there's no high explosive or anything of that nature. Basically, you pressurize this, this blast tube and you break a small diaphragm within the tube and that lets the pressure out. And as the pressure builds, as it expands to this end right here, where you have a fixture, could be a window, could be a door, could be a structural element, um, the pressures generated will simulate those of, of a blast. So this is kind of a blast testing device, if you will, that does not involve uh, you know, an actual explosive. So this actually just shows what we can do with computational fluid dynamics versus a actual test. So what we see is that, what we like to see is that this, the shock wave actually mimics the actual shock wave uh, pretty, pretty well. And that's important because we want to be able, we want to have confidence in our computational uh, methodologies. And again, one of the, uh, you know, we talk a little bit about what drove all this and, you know, was it 9-11? Was it something else? From a progressive collapse standpoint, especially in a lot of the ATFP, um, many people will, will trace that back to Oklahoma City and the, uh, the Murrow building in 1995. And this was actually, you know, this wasn't, I won't say the first, but this has really brought a, a great deal of attention to the concept of progressive collapse and what happens when key elements of a structure are removed, in this case by the blast, and then what happens to the rest of the structure. So this was a really important um, watershed moment, if you will, in basically shedding light and pushing forward this, this idea of progressive collapse and some other issues with ATFP design. Again, with multi-hazard, we focus a lot on windows and glazing and curtain wall, because what we find is that for a lot of types of threats, it's the actual glass and the fragmentation of the glass that can cause, cause the most injuries and most fatalities. And I think this is supposed to be in here. So you can see you're inside a building and that's the glass being blown in as the event occurs outside. So you can see the fragmentation. And in Oklahoma City, most of the injuries were actually glass injuries, um, the majority of, of the injuries. So we always were concerned about glazing. And again, this is not just um, public buildings, even industrial buildings. There's a lot of, of commercial structures where there is concern and there's concern about um, you know, whether real or otherwise of what types of threats may be out there. So as an engineer perhaps getting started in this field or in, in structural engineering, um, especially you know, firms that do work in you know, earthquake engineering or do other types of special uh, design, whether it be different types of structural dynamics, you may be asked to start looking or may be asked to, to work on projects that involve this type of design. So that was a quick, very quick walkthrough of some of the other types of loads. And I wanna kind of bring it back to the seismic design and, and pull it all together for, because seismic design is, is obviously why we're here. Um, it's the backbone of the ERI, uh, at least this ERI talk. 
And of course, it's, it's my passion. So for seismic design, we have uh, codes for new buildings, right? We talked about that. We have the IBC and we have ASE 7, which is the reference document. And then of course, for existing buildings, some of you may be familiar with ASC 41, and we're currently using ASC 4117. And I had the arrow with the question mark because it's always curious and it's a huge area of debate as to whether how new buildings fit, that are designed per the IBC slash ASC 7, how those will fare when actually then analyzed per ASC 41. So there's a consistency issue that the industry and the, and the um, structural engineers and earthquake engineers are trying to, trying to resolve. So from a code standpoint, um, maybe some of you have had an earthquake class um, as part of your undergraduate or graduate program. So maybe this looks a little bit familiar, but once we get to ASC 716, from a seismic standpoint, we're referred to the USGS seismic maps. And then we're also referred to other documents. In this case, I'm pointing to the concrete and the steel documents for design of different types of structures and structural elements. So what is the issue? The issue is that the building codes are really a minimum set of standards. So it's basically what we call a life safety standard. It provides life safety for the building occupants, but really does little, if anything, to protect the building from an economics or a, um, an occupancy standpoint or resumed occupancy standpoint. So we anticipate structural and non-structural damage. And again, really the code doesn't care if your building's a complete loss for the most part. There are some buildings that are special depending on the risk category, but for the most part, the vast majority of buildings were focused on life safety and whether or not that building is a complete loss after a seismic event is, you know, it's harsh to say this, but it's really not the focus of what the building code's about. So for those of you that have been through the code, this may look familiar and we can see there are importance factors in the building code to help address what we consider to be more important buildings. So for instance, if we have a hospital or we have a fire station or an essential building, we categorize those as a risk category for structure. And you can see that we increase the seismic importance factor as shown in this graphic, along with the importance factors of the other, um, other conventional design requirements. And typically, again, these are used for risk category th uh, four and some risk category three buildings for the most part. Risk category two, which is our regular construction, Again, you can see the importance factor is simply one. So performance objectives. So we have critical buildings. We have our essential facilities, the hospitals, the fire stations, et cetera. We wanna avoid economic loss. What does that mean? It means we avoid business interruption. We, you know, we don't lose market share and we hopefully don't lose inventory. So, these are all types of things that we wanna think about as design engineers and our owner and our design teammates. So we may be part of a design team. We may be part of a large design team with architects and other engineers, even developers. And if it's a critical or essential facility, the code will dictate that it gets a higher importance level. If it's not, it may be up to us to, to broach that subject and say, hey, have you thought about this? you know, what is your objective for the structure after an event? Are you worried about different types of losses, economic loss or losses to your inventory? So this is actually a topic that's been going on for a while. And I wanted to kind of point out two, two, uh, two trends, if you will, or are really, they're really part of the same trend, if you will. So on the left, there's a, a quote about resiliency and it's the ability to adapt to changing conditions and to maintain or regain function, functionality or vitality. So basically it's that regaining functionality that really appeals to um, many of us engineers, especially when we focus on seismic and other hazards. And more to that point, uh, there was an excellent document just put out as a joint document by FEMA, 
NIST and NEHRP focused on options for improving the built environment relative to functional recovery time. So this is a really hot topic right now. Um, so for those students that are maybe interested in seismic and, and where things are going in the future, this idea of functional recovery and resiliency are huge topics. And that is basically the ability to recover and to resume operation and to basically be there as part of, of, of the ongoing recovery effort for the, uh, you know, for society as part of that region. So how come codes don't take care of that? You know, why we have, a, we have this great building code, why can't we rely on the building code? Well, we don't really have a, a very predictable performance level in the code. We, caught, we talk about life safety, but you know, that can mean different things for different structures. So it's, it's tough to, to really um, you know, devolve or, or to, to flesh out a, a solid um, you know, performance level from the building code. We do say it's life safety, but again, that can mean different things for different structures. Again, that doesn't really attempt to reduce economic loss or business interruption. And the owner's expectations may or may not have been met if there's an event such as an earthquake. Okay, so this is kind of an old slide, but you know, there's the engineer <laughs> on his drafting table with, so we know it's old because he's not working in front of a computer with his, his BIM model. But basically the developer, the owner's asking, you know, hey, what happened to my investment? So, and this is, this is a good reminder of what is guaranteed or not guaranteed when we design per the code. So, you know, how do we protect that investment? How do we help owners protect that investment? Well, we don't rely strictly on the building code. And this is a lot harder than it sounds because as a structural engineer, your input may be limited early in the project. So, you know, the project may be, if you're part of a larger team, the project may actually be well down the road by the time you as a structural engineer get involved. So it can be tough to bring up certain issues or facts or ideas because a lot of times those, you know, will be going against the grain or against the tide, if you will, of the project. But again, if you can do it right, if you can get everybody on board, you have the entire team pulling in the same direction. And there we have the developer the tenant, the owner, the architect, everybody's pulling in the same direction and agreeing on really what we want out of the design. So to that effect, we do have a great tool that I mentioned previously, and that is ASC 4117, the seismic evaluation and retrofit of existing buildings. And I bring this up in, in the topic of this, in this presentation of multi-hazard, because we actually have started using this guideline for other hazards as well. Not the nuts and bolts, so obviously it's written for seismic, but the way it describes performance, uh, we use that to help owners and other team members understand the types of performance and how it might relate to different levels of hazard. So again, this allows the team, the owner, to have more control over the expected building performance. So here I would say, not only is there fewer surprises if there's an earthquake, but you can insert other hazards in here as well. So fewer surprises if there's an extreme wind event or other types of hazards, provided that they've, also, they've followed through and designed for those hazards. So this is an excellent um, graphic that I really like. And again, this is a typical, this is one of these graphics that we'll use to help understand not only from a seismic perspective, but for also the other hazards, what it means to design to a higher performance level relative to a hazard level. So on the left of this graph, you can see the hazard level, and these are ex uh, expressed both as probability and also return periods, versus on the top axis, we have performance level. So our basic safety objective, if you will, the life safety type of event we typically think about would be uh, demonstrated along this line. And then if we want to enhance or go to an enhanced objective or an enhanced design, we would be somewhere along this bottom line. Okay, so to, to really get an idea of that, if you know we have a, an event that we're designed for life safety at perhaps a 975 year event, if we move out to this enhanced objective line, 
we're designing for the 970 a year event, but now we're more somewhere between operational and immediate occupancy. Okay, so that is a much more robust type of event. It's a more resilient structure and non-structural uh, system, but a cost, there, there's cost associated with that. So we try to have this conversation with the owner and the design team as early as possible. Uh, on the left is a chip plant or a picture of a chip plant. And this is a, a classic type of business where every day that they're out can mean millions of dollars in lost revenue. Right. So they want the building to be life safe. They want to protect the occupants of the building. But the key here for them from an owner, honestly, is how quickly can I be back in business after this particular hazard? So we're showing for an earthquake in this, in this graphic. But again, this could be a different type of hazard, whether man-made or natural. <clears throat> so this is a kind of a classic old slide. It's pretty old. But I, I like it because it helps describe the difference between operational and immediate occupancy and life safety. And the real difference is where as life safety, um, you know, basically everybody gets out safely, it gets out alive, but the building could be a complete loss. So if we were doing a post earthquake assessment on this building on Joe's bar here at life safety, this might be a red or yellow tag basically because the building is no longer habitable. We move over to immediate occupancy or operational, both these buildings are probably okay to go inside, but only the operational still has the non-structural capability to, you know, in terms of electric and other that it can actually be uh, operational in terms of, you know, doing what it's supposed to do. So immediate occupancy means you can go inside, but you may not have the utilities and so forth, whereas operational means you're ready to go basically in, in function as you're intended. Huge part of that is non-structural and non-structural elements are often the weak link in the system. Uh, structural engineers, we often like to focus on the structure itself. Um, even though, you know, uh, within ASCE um, 7 in chapters 13, chapters 15 and others, other locations, there are non-structural criteria. Often these are not paid quite the same amount of attention as the structure itself. And a lot of times the non-structural elements can drive the loss. So we think about both the design and the installation of these elements as being very important. Um, and lastly, I would just say that, you know, I, I don't wanna paint a too dire of a picture because there's a lot of great things going on in the profession, in the technology. Um, one of the technologies that came about in the last maybe 10 years or so that's really being implemented um, widely are these buckling restraint brace frames, BRBs. And you see these gaining in popularity, um, you know, throughout different earthquake regions around the world. So there's a lot of great technology, a lot of great research going on. So, um, you know, while it looks like there's, you know, a, a, a lot of loss and a lot of damage, there's actually a, a really a real bright side to a lot of the technologies that we're seeing here coming forward. From a cost standpoint, you often get asked if you're working with a, a design team as a structural engineer, you'll get asked what it means to go ahead and upgrade the seismic performance. And that's really a tricky question because upgrading um, one building to a operational level, it could take, you know, one to 2% of the construction cost and a different building, it could be one half of 1% of the construction cost. So again, these are construction costs. These are not the structural cost. And you have to be very, very careful when talking about uh, premiums to upgrade that you differentiate between construction costs and structural costs. Okay. So I know that was kind of a quick run through, but uh, Really, the idea is how do we think about seismic in terms of multi hazard design, right? So, we're all folk, we, you know, ERI is a, the focus is on seismic, and uh, seismic gets a lot of research, and a lot of us are focused on seismic, but we realize we're living in a different world. We're living in a world we have more frequent hurricanes, more frequent floods, um, other types of hazards. So, we want to be able, as a structural engineer, we want to be able to bring to the table the ability to design for all these hazards concurrently. So, how do we do that? It seems kind of daunting. But the first thing is, and what we, what we tell people is to keep the low cases separate. 
So it sounds simple, but sometimes it gets conflated. And we try to keep things simple, but keep them, keep them separate. Be very cognizant what type of uh, design you're looking at. Are you doing a code design? Are you doing an ultimate design? Um, so code, if we're doing seismic or we're doing standard wind design, might be fine. If we're doing uh, a very, very high wind, maybe we want to be thinking more about ultimate. And for sure, in the blast or other types of ATFP design areas, we definitely want to be thinking about ultimate. So understand the difference between code and ultimate and keep that, uh, keep that separate. And again, owner education is key, right? Because you're, you know, it's typically you don't own the project. You're just, you're working on the project at the behest of someone else. And it's key that you educate not, the, not only the owner, but the rest of your design team. And then to coordinate the between disciplines. So we see that a lot in seismic where if we don't coordinate well between the disciplines, especially with the non-structural, we see some unfortunate uh, failures. And that goes forward with other types of design as well whether it be hurricane, whether it be blast, we really have to maintain well-coordinated uh, well, you know, well, well uh, communication between the different disciplines. And a constructability is a, is a big issue, and I'll talk about that in a second. So lastly, I, and I was kind of moving through quickly because I wanted to leave some time for questions if there are any. I'll just show a very simple uh, example. This is kind of a simple building. It's but it, it, it's simple in that it's, it's only, um, you know, really a one story structure, maybe one and a half, two story, depending on, on different parts of the building and what you consider a story. But the way it was, came about and the way it's designed uh, kind of fits to the multi-hazard design standpoint. So it's a 30,000 square foot uh, ECC, Emergency Communication Center. So it's basically a combined 911 call center and a response center. So this is the building after an event, whether it's an earthquake, whether it's a tornado, whether it's something else, this is the building you absolutely wanna have around because this is the building where you're gonna get all your 911 calls and you're gonna coordinate all your emergency response. So the challenge was not only to design it for seismic at a high level, so occupancy category, actually a risk category of four per the code, but also to look at an extreme wind at 180 mile an hour tornadic wind per the ICC 500. And then they also wanted it designed uh, per the DOD's uh, ATFP criteria, which is UFC 41001. So you might be asking, well, you know, what made them think about tornadic winds? And it's really funny because today is actually <laughs> the 10 year anniversary of this very large tornado that struck the Midwest throughout the Midwest. Um, and actually part of it damaged the airport in St. Louis. And so it was a pretty significant event and it tore up quite a, quite a bit of, uh, of the county in St. Louis and <clears throat> actually damaged um, some structures and some other types of elements that were pretty close to where the new ECC was planned. From an anti-terrorism standpoint, you know, that they always fear, and we see some of the civil unrest that goes on. You know, they want to be able to, you know, be able to be a hardened structure and still have the response in case they face some type of uh, civil unrest or some type of malicious type of environment. <clears throat> so what we see are two pictures, and on the left we see um, the way the structure is spread out, and this is because of the mandated stand-up distances. So again, from a blast perspective. We know distance is our is our friend. Um, we can truly reduce the pressures and the impulse that are applied to the building based on the the distance that we can achieve. But we can't really achieve you know all the distance we want all the time. And then we get what we see on the right, which are these huge curtain wall members. So it's kind of tough to under, see in, in great detail. But you see the gentleman. You see you know for size. So the mullions that you see to his right are for the windows and those are designed to take out the blast loads on the windows, which are actually especially designed for the, the blast pressures. And those will take out the loads to the remainder of the structure. And you can just see the size of those tube elements, uh, which are you know, several times larger than you would normally get if it was just a standard curtain wall, curtain wall system. 
So again, with multi-hazard design, constructability can be a huge issue. And so, you know, in high seismic regions, we're used to that, right? We're used to constructability and trying to get, um, you know, all the steel and concrete members with all the ties and the different bars and so forth. But this is to a different level because not only do you have seismic, but you also have other things that maybe the contractor is not used to. So special tie down, special anchorage forces for tonatic winds, special members for blast design. So you need a, a very high level of coordination out in the field with the contractor that's working the job. So really in summary, um, and I know that was a real quick walkthrough that multi-hazard design is actually increasing. Uh, we see that a lot more, especially as we have changing climate and changing priorities and, and things are, are occurring across, not only in the US, but across the world. There's, being, there's a call for other types of design, but besides what we consider conventional. So it's good to be aware of that. And if you, you know, no one expects, especially a, a graduating engineer to know how to do all that, just like they don't expect you to do, you know, know how to do conventional design from the get-go, but it's good to know where to go find the tools and the research and the standards that will help you uh, move forward in those areas. Key element is that one hazard doesn't cover the other hazards. We see that a lot where uh, sometimes owners will say, well, you know, I have a, a seismic design, so I'm, I'm probably good for a hurricane or I'm good for a blast or I have blast design, so it should be okay for, uh, for seismic. And so that's not necessarily true. And so one of the things that's key is that the earthquake engineers, especially earthquake professionals, they're often looked to add, to provide leadership in this area for multi-hazard design because of the maturity of the earthquake engineering field. So the earthquake engineering field, you know, a lot of it led by ERI was often first in many of these areas, first in performance-based design, first in some other topics. So those folks that work in earthquake engineering, the professionals are often, often asked to kind of take a leadership role and help drive, drive some of this, this design in the multi-hazard area. And then lastly is this constructability issue. Um, you know, we can have a wonderful design. We can be really proud of our design team and proud of ourselves. And, you know, everybody's patting themselves on the back for what a wonderful design. But if your constructability and your construction doesn't go well, um, you know, that will quickly be forgotten. So constructability is, is huge. And then very lastly is a plug for ERI. Um, I think it's a tremendous organization, especially for those that are involved in earthquake engineering. Um, again, the multidiscipline involvement and the opportunities that it, that it allows um, are really hard to, to find anywhere else. So huge fan. So again, uh, hopefully I left a couple minutes of time. This is, uh, oh, this is actually the team that I was with in New Zealand. And that's, so, that's one of the great opportunities that ERI has is for some post recon, post earthquake recon. And if uh, for the students, if you ever are presented with this kind of opportunity, absolutely recommend that you, uh, that you participate. So with that, um, I think we can, I'll stop sharing my screen and be happy to take any questions. Thanks, Nathan. Yeah. I, I have a question to start, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, so I was interested in what you were talking about for uh, performance-based seismic design. I do a lot of that stuff now. Sure. Um, and I was wondering, um, do you have any experience with like uh, base isolation of structures? Yeah, uh, we've done some base isolated structures and I call that kind of the Cadillac of um, high performance seismic design um, because obviously, um, you know, for all intents and purposes, you, you get tremendous amount of protection with a base isolated structure. Um, there's some misnomers that you don't, you don't have to do anything else, which is untrue. You still have to design the rest of the structure. Uh, you're trading acceleration for displacement, basically. The, the issue is, is that, you know, there is a substantial cost increase and it's not just the cost of the isolators. Um, the non-structural, everything that, so for those of you not really familiar with base isolation, you have a moat typically or a, a line that goes around your building. 
that basically allows the structure to move relative to the ground. And this moat, if you will, has to be crossed by all your utilities. And so that becomes a huge um, construction issue typically. And you have to provide enough slack, if you will, or an, enough leeway in the different utilities, um, water, gas, electric, et cetera, that everything has to get over that, that line or that demarcation line and have enough flexibility so it won't be torn apart during, during an event. But it's a, great, uh, it's a great way to go for special structures. We see that a lot for data centers, um, you know, those type of structures where basically the value of what's in the structure tremendously outweighs the actual value of the structure itself. Well, I'm glad you mentioned the uh, the cost um, because that kind of lead it into the second question I wanted to ask about sure. that is um, you mentioned owner education. So mm -hmm. something that that I've learned and that I've kind of found doing research is that um, and I want to get your opinion on this. Do you believe that the R factors that we use in seismic design are maybe a bit too high, which which, um, you know, reduces cost and makes it uh, less attractive to go towards base isolation and <laughs> performance-based design. Uh, yeah, yeah, just a thought. Yeah, no, that's a great topic. I mean, you could get, you know, uh, 50 engineers in a room, st structural engineers, and you'd have like 50 different opinions. Mm -hmm. um, a, where, no, where the R factors originally came from, because that's a, that's a whole nother topic, right? I mean, you know, there's no, a lot of those that you, you wonder if people were just throwing darts at a dartboard. Exactly. But, yeah. Um, <laughs> You know, you would think after we've had Northridge, Loma Prieta, um, you know, New Zealand and uh, the earthquakes in Japan that we would, you know, know enough about the fragility of different elements that maybe we would have a, a pretty good comfort level. But I, I think that's a good point. Um, I don't know if, you know, the profession's ready to tighten those up quite yet, depending on what it would mean from a design standpoint. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of pushback when you try to make certain changes, um, sure. which is why I, I think functional, this whole idea of, of functional resilience and functional recovery is great. I'm interested to see how that plays out in the wider community. Um, once we get outside the technical arena and you start talking to owners, developers, you know, people that have a very high level of financial interest in these projects, um, how they're going to feel about certain things that if you know tighten up the design requirements because i've had people ask me well it's a no-brainer why don't we design all these buildings to a higher level you know why life safety mm -hmm. you know why aren't we designed for you know median occupancy and it's, it's money and um you know you sit around in in technical forums and it's easy to to convince yourself that there's a, a better way to do it but you, it's important to recognize especially for you know for those in the field and working in the day-to-day -day profession that there are a lot of competing interests. And, you know, you may sit there and go, well, it's obvious, can't everyone see it? We should be designing for this. And, you know, the rest of the team is shaking their head no, because, you know, that, that doesn't make sense from a economic standpoint, or at least a first, you know, a first cost economic standpoint. And they don't wanna talk about, you know, the earthquake 20 years later or whatever that may be. So it's a good question. Um, I don't know, you know, if those will change drastically here in the next few years. I think they kind of change piecemeal as new research comes out. But we'll see. Um, you know, I'm hopeful that this idea of performance-based design and through functional recovery will, will push forward a little bit. Um, but, you know, every time I hope that I run into developers and others that basically throw cold water on that. So we'll see. Thanks. Related, yeah. related to that, I'm just curious from, you know, you've done a lot of work in the Midwest as well as other regions, but, you know, in New England where we are, I think there's resistance, especially for everyday structures, you know, not, not the state of the art call center or whatever to really put emphasis on something that's not seen by the public as being a, a significant risk. And I think that that, I, I was wondering if you have a perspective on um, whether it's Midwest or, or you know, nationally or internationally of how, whether that's, whether you see any shift in that 
and whether um, I think you were involved with the ERI school stuff for a mm -hmm. while or, um, you know, how like these essential structures such as schools, such as, you know, emergency facilities, if, if there isn't the general push to do it for everyday structures, you would think that those would be done, but they're not. And, and what, what do you think it would take to, to get the focus on those? Yeah, that's a good question. I think that definitely West Coast has more visibility because of the frequency of the earthquakes, at least, uh, at least the perceived frequency. Um, so it may, it's a little bit easier uh, road out West, Midwest, East Coast, uh, you know, we design differently to an extent. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, you look at what happened with the safe rooms. So like safe rooms have been integrated into school design now. Safe rooms are these spaces that like in a high wind or a tornadic wind event, you, you know, people can go to, it's not really, you can't live there, but you can go there to shelter um, for those of you who aren't really familiar with them. And, and so now they're being integrated in certain types of structures in, in the later codes. Um, I think it's just a tough, there's these competing forces that tend to push back against any type of, of movement to, to elevate the design. Um, you know, both for residential um, and commercial structures, there's, you get this pushback. So for, you know, people that may or may not be aware that when these codes get to, you know, these codes are committees of people. So you have plenty of engineers, you know, you have practicing engineers, you have academics, but you also have people from different, different uh, industry groups. So AISC, ACI, they're all there, but you also have folks that represent owners and different types of owner associations as well. So there are competing interests. Um, you know, I think if this functional recovery idea and this additional resilience catches on out west, I think it would it might migrate through the Midwest and East Coast um, eventually. You know, if we have another like Superstorm Sandy or some other types of events, uh, you know, a large hurricane coming up the East Coast, or even a moderate earthquake in you know, New England or up, upstate New York or something, um, you know, definitely would change some perception, but it's, it's, it's tough because, um, you know, it's, there's a lot of inertia to try to overcome. I just a follow up to that. So with is a way of doing that when you mentioned like Superstorm Sandy or some regional hazard is, you know, from your multi-hazard um, thought, an approach to design, is there a way of taking a local hazard and rolling in some things that would help other hazards as well in that same design? For sure, for sure. So for instance, let's say you went to a higher level glazing system. So let's say you had a, um, you know, let's say you had a school building, for instance. <clears throat> and, you know, maybe the school building, maybe, it, you know, there's a different type, maybe there's a certain kind of threat, maybe it's an industrial threat, or maybe there's other threats, and you went to an enhanced glazing system or an enhanced facade, and oh, by the way, that the same facade basically would also really help the school survive a, a hurricane or a really extreme wind event. So, you know, one, it's not always, a, you know, I, I had a slide where it said, you know, designing for one doesn't necessarily help the others, but there are certain aspects and certain pieces of the structure where if you design for one, you do get benefits from others. So wind and blast, um, while quite different types of loading, you know, do have, do have some elements that when you strengthen for one, you will get a uh, benefit for another. And similar with seismic from a lateral system standpoint. So, um, you know, I think it's just, it's, it comes down to an overall philosophy. And it's, you know, it's the idea of having to move away from this life safety. The, issue, the funny thing is about life safety is in the building code is that if you ask an owner or even an architect, honestly, if you ask a lot of these design professionals outside of structural or even some structural, but outside of the, you know, the earthquake or other type of fields, what is the philosophy or what is the intent of a building code? They might not really understand that. You know, so if you sit down with a developer or an owner and you explain to him or her, hey, you know, after this windstorm or after this earthquake, you know, your building may not be occupiable. It may not, it may be a total loss. A lot of times that's the first they may have ever heard of that. They could be totally surprised. So there's a lot of education, but 
Um, you know, like I said, it, it, I, I'm, I hold out hope, but there's a lot of inertia to overcome in terms of the way things are done. And of course, you know, for those, you know, we always hear that people say, this is how we've always done it, right? So it's that inertia that can be difficult. Did I run? I'll ask another question unless someone else has one. I have a question um, about the approach to blast versus the approach to like earthquake or wind. So, I mean, with earthquake, wind, these are like natural hazards, but with blast, you're dealing with um, could be like a man made hazard. So, I'm wondering mm -hmm. how you um, deal with the large degree of uncertainty that comes with trying to design for a blast load, how you're varying the parameters such that you're really um, making a design that is realistic of what might happen. That's a great, that's a great question. Um, that's really a good question because the, the dirty little secret is uh, we design for a lot less than really, um, uh, I hate to say that, but somebody with malicious intent, um, you know, like what we saw with the Oklahoma city there, that was a tremendous amount of, 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 of power. Uh, so typically with in the blast world, what we do is we, we, regardless of what they uh, they use, whether it's like, uh, you know, um, ANFO, uh, money, you know, so like fertilizer and, and fuel oil or something else, it always gets classified or, or equivalent to a, a certain number of pounds of TNT. That's just how we express that type of, of event. And this, we typically design for, I won't say really low, but a lot lower than you, you would assume it could be transported to a facility or to a site by an industrious person or persons. Um, that being said, you have to have a level. You have to, you have to settle on a level that is, you know, can be designed for that people can understand. So there are levels that are out there that are in those DOD documents that are in some other documents um, that are basically, um, um, you know, specify the types of the equivalent TNT load that is, is designed for. So in industrial uh, areas, so like in a, in a, for instance, a, a refinery or some other type of chemical plant, there's also, you know, we may have a blast risk in that and we have different types of loading. Um, and those, that type of loading is actually generated actually from the actual source. So you do typically what's called a siting study, siting, S-I-T-I-N-G, siting study. And in those studies, you'll actually develop from the threat, from the source that you're concerned about. So maybe it's a pressure vessel explosion or something else. You can actually generate the loads, the actual loads, the pressures and the impulses from that. So um, I don't know if that answers your question. I guess the, the level of confidence in the actual defining the threat and from an industrial source is probably a little bit higher than from a malicious, than a malicious intent, if that makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Great. Do we have any other questions? Yeah, I'll ask one last quick one and then I'll let you guys go. Um, have you worked with any projects where you've done um, uh, three axis loading um, and earthquake design. So like including like the vertical um, earthquake accelerations. And have you found any uh, anything interesting in doing that as opposed to traditional um, horizontal ground motion studies? Sure. Um, well, I guess just first, you know, the code now requires a vertical component that mm -hmm. point two SDS be considered as part of the standard, um, the standard uh, code equations, the low combination equations in ASC seven. But to your to your point, yeah, we have um, we have some projects. Typically, they're special projects. Um, they may be for a you know a specialized customer or different type of agency or whatever, where they'll actually have a full a full vertical ground motion um, being applied, and that can be interesting. Um, you know, it can really affect the way you design your system, especially your anchorage, um, that has a lot of, lot of impact. Um, you know, I've seen, you know, a lot of 
equipment, especially in New Zealand, they had a huge vertical component in that earthquake. I think they had up to about a G. And, you know, we, so we saw equipment getting bounced, you know, equipment that weighs two, three, 4,000 pounds getting bounced across the floor like a, like a soccer ball. So, you know, we know it's there and we know it exists. We just not, you know, we, we, so we pay a little bit of attention to it in conventional design with that point to SDS, but really we don't pay a, a huge amount of attention unless it's a really, it's, a, it's an important structure and, and the requirements ask us to do so. So I don't know if that answers your question, but uh, I mean, there are, there are structures that you will be asked that you may be asked to consider the vertical component, but it's pretty rare, a serious yeah. component. No, definitely. Thanks for, thanks for answering. Sure. All right. All right. Um, so uh, I guess Hernan just posted a link to our next talk. Um, Dr. Gould, would you like to take a break? Uh, this one did run over a little bit. Yeah, um, that's fine. What time's the next talk? Uh, I was uh, supposed to be at 340, so we're a little over, but. How about just, can you give me 10 minutes? Yeah, sure thing. Of course. All right. All right. I'll, I'll, I'll dial into the, or I'll link into the uh, other website in 10 minutes. All right. Sounds good. All right. Thank you all. I'll see you in a bit. Bye-bye.